So here in this first slide, so this is gonna be a Blackboard uh, uh, course. In this first slide, you have uh, an approximate uh, description of the content of the, of the lectures. We only have six hours, so I'm not sure how much we're gonna be able to cover. So I guess uh, uh, the first part is very certain and then things will become a little bit more uh, uh, quantum-like, I guess, more uh, uncertain as we go on, but maybe I can do everything, okay? So most of the content of this course is classical. We're gonna talk about pretty simple properties of black holes in general relativity. However, uh, the perspective would be to, you know, get familiar or discuss, get into, you know, the discussion of some properties which are actually very relevant for the interpretation of many of the things we try to do in quantum gravity. So that's why, I mean, the end of the lecture has this, uh, this uh, item here. Um, uh, challenges for quantum gravity. So the idea is that, you know, the, the, the course will help us, you know, get the get to the level in which we can discuss some of the some questions that I think are very important for the future, uh, for future research in, in our that might be important for future research in our field. So with that said, let me start. So many of these things are pretty basic. If you have had some course on, on, on general relativity, especially if you have followed Wald, then there would be many things that you will that would resonate with Wald. So if you, if you are familiar with these things, if you know these things, just relax and listen to them again. So it's never hurting, I, I think. And uh, you would see that, I mean, some of the interpretations and discussions are, I hope, uh, you know, some things that you cannot read in, in, in a textbook on general relativity because it's more oriented to our interest, which is quantum gravity. All right, so I'm gonna start by the first item. So we discuss the geometry of uh, the Schwarzschild solution. Mm -hmm. So because we have time, limited time, I'm gonna talk about the um, uh, vacuum solution. That you are all familiar with. So the line element in coordinates adapted to the symmetry of the space time is given by this one minus two m over r, where m is the gravitational mass of the space time times dt square dr square divided by one minus two m over r plus r square d omega square, which denotes uh, the line el element, the metric of the unit sphere. So this is a vacuum spherically symmetric solution of Einstein's equations. And uh, just because of spherical symmetry and vacuum implies via the Birkhoff theorem that uh, the space time is actually static. So what does it mean for space time to be static? It means that it is stationary. We see what stationary means and that in addition, it, con it has a natural notion of time, re time reversal symmetry. Which in this case is just the symmetry, discrete symmetry that sends the coordinate T in, the, in which we are writing the line element to minus T, which is an obvious symmetry of the line element. So stationarity means that uh, there is an isometry of the space-time, which is time-like. This means that there exists a killing field So briefly, what is a killing field? A killing field, a vector field is called a killing field when uh, it, uh, you know, orbits define an isometry of the space-time. So in equations, this means that the lead derivative along this vector field. So imagine you have in space-time some vector field V and the Lie derivative of the metric is given by twice the covariant derivative of the vector field symmetrized. So 
when you have an isometry, this is equal to zero. This is called the Killing equation. So because the space-time is stationary, there is a time-like Killing field. Being stationary means that there is a flow in space-time, which is time-like in nature. So light cones are like this. The flow goes like this. And this Killing field will be denoted here as, uh, so we're going to denote this time-like Killing field psi. So if I put indices, abstract indices, this is psi a. So there is a stationarity means that there is a killing field, grad a psi b symmetrized equal to zero. And that psi dot psi is less than zero. I am using, as you can see here, uh, uh, the signature where time like things have negative norm, negative inner product themselves. So this is what stationarity means. And uh, as you know, I mean, this leader derivative, if you adapt your coordinates so that the vector field, the flow, vector defining the flow in space time, sorry, I mean, uh, is adapted to one of the coordinates, say the coordinate x, then in coordinates, the leader derivative is simply the partial derivative of the metric component. So this has to be zero. So if you are in an adapted coordinate system, then the components of the metric do not depend on the coordinate x that in, in this case is adapted to the flow. In our case, this uh, vector field psi is written in the coordinates here is written, the, the coordinate x is actually t, so this is d by dt a. And how do we know that? How do we know this is a, so this gives us a very easy way of checking that you have a Killing field when your line element is adapted to the coordinate system, adapted to the isometry. So here we see that the metric is Time in the components of the metric are time independent. So we immediately see by inspection that psi is d by dt. And by the way, it's easy to check that this is a time-like vector field, at least when we are in the region. So this is time-like for r greater than 2m. So what does it mean to be static? Staticity. requires that psi is hypersurface orthogonal, namely that there are surfaces, in this case, the t equal constant surfaces, which are normal to the vector, the Killing vector field. And if that's the case, you can, in the adapted coordinates, the metric would look like that. There wouldn't be any term of the form dt times dxi, where xi would be the other three coordinates. There are no terms like that. And this is the reason why the metric, the static metric becomes symmetric under the change. I mean, it's time reversal symmetric with respect to uh, the killing parameter T. Okay, so in addition to static, Birkhoff theorem implies that it is static. Uh, it comes from spherical symmetry. What does it mean uh, for this space time to be spherical symmetry, uh, symmetric? Well, it's obvious again from the form of the line element, perhaps. Of Schwarzschild. So it means that there are three killing fields, psi one, psi two, and psi three, such that psi i, psi j, commu sorry, commutator of, not, some brackets. Um, the commutator, the vector field commutator of this reproduces the Lie algebra of the rotation group. Because these vector fields are non commuting, of course, you know, what are these vector fields? If you have a, the orbit of SO3, R spheres, and so these vector fields are, for, for example, rotations around. So a complete family of uh, these vector fields could be this, rotations around the z-axis, rotations around the an orthogonal x-axis, and finally rotations around the y-axis. These are the three ones. But because they do not commute, you, can, you cannot adapt your coordinates to the, simultaneously to the three vector fields, so you can only adapt them to one. And so 
we are choosing here, if you look at the line element again, so I forgot how to go to the previous page. Yes, uh, this one. Okay, so if you look at the, at the, at the line element, you see that because you have nothing depends on theta on phi. And so we call this um, vector field, the one which is adapted to the coordinates, simply psi, which would be the white one here, if we think of this as being the Z axis. So this is our killing field that represents rotate axis symmetry. So, so space-time is spherically symmetric, but in particular axis symmetry. So in the presence of these symmetries, it's very important because of a very simple lemma that leads to the existence of conserved quantities when we study several things. In particular, when we test the geometry, we test particles. So, so there are conserved quantities along geodesics thanks to this lemma, which is extremely important. It's very simple, but it appears, it's gonna appear once and again and again along this course. So the lemma says that if a vector field Ka is geodesic, and by geodesic, I mean a finely parameterized geodesic, so Ka grad A, Kb equal to zero. And if psi A is a killing field, namely grad A psi B symmetrized equal to zero, then C defined as the inner product between the Keeling field and the uh, tangent to the geodesic is conserved along the geodesics. Is a constant of motion. So the proof fits inside this little box. So we want to prove that Ka grad A of C equals zero, right? So that along the geodesic curve, C does not change. So directional derivative of C must be zero. And now just the Leibniz rule says that this is grad A of psi B times um, KB. So you just develop this, you get two terms. The first term is zero. So the term, this term that you get here from the Leibniz rule will be zero. Sorry, the term in which I better write it, but okay. The term in which the gradient acts there is zero because of the geodesic equation. And the term where the gradient acts here is zero because you get a symmetric tensor, this, the tensor KK contracted with the anti-symmetric tensor because the symmetric part of the gradient of psi is zero because of the killing equation. So both terms are zero and therefore this quantity is conserved. Okay, so when we have um, this, uh, uh, so isometries, therefore, so if there are directions in space time along which the metric is lead dragged, then for each one of these isometries, so we have a conserved quantity when we consider geodesic motion. So you have a geodesic with tangent vector Ka. So, and, uh, so all this implies that the inner product between these two vector fields 
is constant along, sorry, constant along this green line here. So there is a link between symmetries of space time of the space time and conserved quantities. This might evoke uh, uh, a well-known theorem in classical mechanics, Netter's theorem. So there is an explicit link to Netter's theorem. that I leave as an exercise. But I tell you how you would go about proving it. I mean, it's very easy. So if you consider a test particle such that a free particle such that, so you have to write the action that will lead to the geodesic equation. Remember the green curve here is a geodesic. What is the action that gives you this? Is an action which is proportional to the integral of the length, you know, GAB, KA, KB, D lambda, okay? So in, well, and more explicitly maybe in coordinates. So the action is G mu nu DX mu by D lambda, DX nu by D lambda. This is the action whose equations of motion give you the geodesic equation, right? So you just explicitly write this action and you would see that for each one of, uh, of the isometries of space time, of course, you will have a symmetry of the Lagrangian of this test particle. And so you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between the conserved quantities that we find with this little simple lemma and Noether's conserved quantities associated to this uh, test particle action. So this is, this, uh, these conservation laws are very important because it, uh, they allow us to completely integrate the geodesic equation in the Schwarzschild background. And knowing about geodesic motion, it's very important when interpreting the properties of the geometry of the Schwarzschild solution. So let me just uh, talk about the geodesics on the uh, Schwarzschild background. So we want to integrate the geodesic equation. So we are looking for vector fields. I'm gonna call them U for now. I mean, that's the generic name that for time like uh, geodesics one gives to, to, because one thinks of four velocity. So we, want, we are looking for vector fields that satisfy the geodesic equation, the finely parameterized geodesic equation. Or perhaps I should have written this index. I mean, it's the same equation, but the index upstairs. So we want to solve this equation. This is a complicated equation. If you write it explicitly in terms of coordinates, it's like Newton's equation. It's a second order differential equation and it's hard to solve in general. But in the case of Schwarzschild, because of the presence of conserved quantities associated with the isometries that we just described, we can solve this by quadratures and we can actually map the problem of solving the geodesics uh, in the uh, Schwarzschild background to a problem of motion, a simple problem of classical mechanics with a central potential. So this is what I call the relativistic Kepler problem. So let's do that very quickly. So you, this is the tangent vector to the geodesic that can be written in arbitrary coordinates as dx mu by d lambda times d by dx mu a. So which means that in our coordinates, this will be, so d by d lambda, lambda is the affine parameter, is the parameter, which is called an affine parameter when you get zero in the geodesic equation. Uh, affine parameters are defined up to um, linear rescaling. This is gonna be important at some point. So I can always map some affine parameter to another one by doing a linear transformation. That's all, that's the only ambiguity in the definition of affine parameters. And this makes them particularly interesting when you want to choose physically defined co coordinates. So if you want to remove part of the arbitrariness about choosing coordinates in some situations, 
affine parameters along geodesics is important. Okay, so uh, let me write U then explicitly in the Schwarzschild coordinates that we introduced. Derivative respect to a fine parameter will be called just dot. So I have T dot times D by DT, A plus R dot. I'm just writing this equation in the Schwarzschild coordinates, D by DR, A plus theta dot, D by D theta, A plus phi dot, D by D phi, A. This is the most general tangent vector that you can write in four dimensional space time in the coordinates that we're using. Now, because of spherical symmetry, one realizes that, I mean, if this is the equatorial plane, some, equa some plane, I mean, one realizes that a motion happens in a plane. So if I look at the spa spatial motion, then um, if I give some initial conditions on, 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 a, on a given plane, then the particle, the geodesic will never leave that plane. And it's gonna be uh, orbiting around, uh, you know, I mean, the Schwarzschild solution can represent, for example, the line element outside the spherically symmetric uh, body. So motion because of spherical symmetry will take place on a given plane. We can always adapt our coordinate system so that this plane is given by the equatorial plane, pi equal to uh, uh, theta equal to pi over two, which means that theta dot is zero. And so we lose this term here. And so now we are very close to completely finishing the, 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 the solution, uh, resolving the problem, because you see that there are only three arbitrary functions that you, we have to obtain to solve the geodesic equation. That is T of lambda, R of lambda, and phi of lambda. And as I, as I will write, as, as I will show now, we have exactly three constants of motion. The first non which will give us three independent conditions to determine completely these three functions. So the first constant, the most trivial constant of motion is called kappa, I'm gonna call it kappa, is minus ua ua, defined as the norm minus the norm of the tangent vector to the geodesics. So if uh, you satisfy the geodesic equation, it's obvious that the norm of the geodesic uh, of the tangent vector is actually constant along the geodesic as the Leibniz rule immediately implies. So this is the first constant of motion that we can write explicitly by just using what the tangent vector is here and sticking it into the um, line element I wrote in the previous slides, okay? So we're gonna get T dot square minus T dot, uh, sorry, not minus, the minus is already been written there. So I get actually plus T dot square times GTT, which is one minus two M over R. It's minus GTT, okay. And then I get minus R dot square divided by, so times minus GRR. So the minus is, okay, do you know what I mean? So I get one minus two M over R here, and then we get minus r square times phi dot square coming from the, coming from the line element of uh, the sphere, which I never wrote explicitly, but I can write here. So this is, well, this is uh, the theta square plus sine square of theta d phi square. And because we are at theta equal to pi over two and d theta is zero, so this term comes from, from, from that last term. So this is our first constant of motion. The next one will use isometries. This first one is a trivial one. It's not related to isometries, but now we use as isometries. So according to our little lemma, there will be something, the, the inner product between the geodesic vector and the time-like healing field the one that is associated to stationarity will have to be conserved. This is just given by, I put the minus sign because this will be interpreted as energy and energy we like it to be positive. Energy of what? I tell you in a moment. So this is given by one minus two M over R times T dot. So what is this? 
this is actually something that has a meaning, a physical meaning at infinity. Why? Because uh, at infinity, the killing field psi has norm minus one, only at infinity. So at infinity, the orbits of the stationarity killing field, I mean, this is how it, this killing field is normalized because if you have a killing field, you can multiply it by 22 and you get another killing field. But the killing stationarity killing field, I should have said it before, must in an asymptotically flat space-time is normalized at infinity to match the orbits of, station, of, of certain stationary inertial observers in this asymptotic flat metric. So infinitely far away, this killing field corresponds to the orbits to the four velocity of real observers. And if you look at this expression, you see that this energy, which is conserved, it's always the same all along the geodesic, at infinity has the interpretation of energy per unit mass. Where I'm using just the interpretation from special relativity. So it's just given, it's going to be equal to one for a massive particle at rest. So this is energy per unit mass. So it's a time component of, in, with respect to an inertial observer at infinity of, uh, you know, the four momentum per unit mass, which is the four velocity. Okay, so that's a nice interpretation for this uh, constant of motion. Then we have another constant of motion which I'm going to call L, and L is the angular momentum, is the other conserved quantity according to our lemma, the inner product of the four velocity with d by d phi. So we recall that this is d by dt in our coordinates, and this one is d by d phi, vector field d by d phi. This gives us r square phi dot, which is which coincides with the standard mechanics expression of angular momentum or the Z component of angular momentum. So it retains the standard interpretation. In particular at infinity, it's pretty obvious that we are talking about angular momentum in the Z direction. So we have one, two, three constants of motion, right? We can solve uh, this problem by quadratures. To do that, we just write the first kappa. You see, we are gonna replace T dot here in kappa in terms of energy divided by one minus two m over R and phi dot in terms of L divided by R square. When we do that, we're gonna find a, an equation that involves only r dot, and that equation is e squared. So we, we, we write t squared as e squared over one over two m over r. And so we get, we get this. So we got one over two m over r squared in the denominator. One of the powers goes away with something in the numerator plus, sorry, minus r dot squared divided by one minus two m over r minus L square over R square. And so this equation can be rearranged in a very nice way. So we can just write R dot square plus kappa plus L square over R square, the whole thing times one minus two M over R. So I'm just uh, solving for R well, multiplying everything by one minus two m over r and putting everything on the same side and except for e squared on that side. So this equation is just equivalent to the previous one. Now, let me just divide by one half everything because if I do divide by one half, this looks like the kinetic energy term in motion um, in a central potential and this like an effective potential V of R. So I can interpret this as 
if you didn't know anything about GR, I could give you this expression in classical mechanics when you discuss motion in central potential, the spherical symmetric systems, potentials that depend only on the radial direction. And this combination here in this analogy has to be interpreted as the total mechanical energy of classical mechanics. Okay, so this equation can be solved. You obtain R of lambda. Once you have R of lambda, then you stick it in the other equations and you get T of lambda. And in this equation, you get phi of lambda and you're done. So we've seen that we have completely resolved the problem. You can completely solve uh, the geodesics by quadratures in this way. So let's look at what this V of R looks like. So V of R, I can just expand what we have there and what we find is that there is a constant, one half of kappa. By the way, kappa is the norm of the geodesic vector. So kappa will take, is minus the norm. So it will be equal to one for time-like geodesics, and it will be zero for null geodesics. So we get one half of kappa minus kappa, times the mass over R, I'm just uh, you know, developing this, expanding this. Then we get a term that is L squared, this term times that times this one half L squared over two R squared. And then we get a term that goes like L squared times M and it's divided by R to the cubed. So all these terms are familiar. Well, this is just a constant. It doesn't have any effect in the motion. This term is the Newtonian potential. This term is also something we know in central motions in central potential. It's just the centrifugal barrier. It's the effect in this effective potential that comes from the conservation of angular momentum. And this term here is the new guy. This term here is the genuine relativistic correction. Why do I call it the correction? Because I mean, you can imagine now motion, if you imagine a test particle moving sufficiently far away from the star, then this term is the one that decays the fastest. So if you are sufficiently far away, this term is just the correction that you can ignore. So when you describe the motion of the earth around the sun, this term is just uh, negligible and you, your orbits, your geodesic motion will coincide with the solutions of the Kepler problem. But as soon as you get into the stronger field region, so if, as, soon, as soon as you approach the sun, then this term will have some effect. And so from classical mechanics, you might remember that if, if you consider motion in the central potential, then uh, there are only two situations in which the orbits around the center are closed. The orbits are closed in two, in two and only two special cases of, of central potential. One is V of R, sorry, one is, I'm not gonna write V of R because there is the, um, uh, the centrifugal barrier. I mean, the other part, one is V that corresponds to a harmonic oscillator. And the other possibility for closed orbits to be pressed, for orbits to be closed, is the Newtonian potential. So, in all other cases, orbits do not close. So, in situations where this is a correction, if you are sufficiently far away from the star, then this will be a small perturbation. And so, what happens? I mean, orbits cannot close anymore but they will almost close. And what you will get, sorry for my bad picture because this is not almost closing, it's really not closing at all. But when this effect is small, you see that you're gonna get the, the first effect that you get in perturbation theory when you treat this as a perturbation, which is something which is a standard exercise in classical mechanics is precession, precession of the orbits. And this is what explains the precession of Mercury. Of course, we're not gonna do all this analysis. We don't have time for that but you see that you can do it if you want it. In particular, let's plot this effective potential. 
So for time like geodesics, so let's study first time like geodesics. U dot U is equal to minus one, which means that kappa is equal to one, as we said. So for kappa equal to one, then the effective potential looks as follows. There are two situations. Situation one, very relativistic situation when L square is not sufficiently important, where L square is less, of course, I mean, well, you see what I'm talking about. Maybe I should have started from the other one. There are two situations when L square is greater than 12 M square, then the potential looks like this. It's, uh, it has a maximum and a minimum and it asymptotes to one half, to the constant but that was one half of kappa that now is one half. So this is V of R. So you see what's happening. If I consider the potential, I, derive, I, take, I look for the extrema of the potential, then if there would be a condition that allows you to have extrema, and this is the condition written up here. So if L square is sufficiently high, you have a minimum and a maximum. If L square is not sufficiently high, then there are no extrema. And so the potential looks like something like that which asymptotes again to one half, of course. So in this case, in the first case here on the left, you see that no matter what you do, the particle, the test particle falls into the black hole. So in fact, uh, this point where the potential is zero, it's always the point R equal to two M the, pot the effective potential vanishes at r equal to 2m. But, and by the way, you see also that the potential is perfectly smooth and well behaved at r equal to 2m, which is the first indication that this place that sounds like a problem when you look at the Schwarzschild line element in these coordinates, namely the, some of the metric components blow up there. This was used to be called the Schwarzschild singularity. It's actually a point where there does not seem to be any problem when you test the geometry, when you probe the geometry in the appropriate way, when you use test particles to test it. Indeed, this, you know, the, the end of the story and we're gonna discuss it briefly. So there is no problem with R equal to 2M, it's just, I will call it apparent singularity, it's just the problem of the coordinate systems the system there. Now, there was a lot of discussion about what was the meaning of R equal to 2M in history, beginning starting from Schwarzschild in 1915 and 16, when he found the solutions of Einstein's equations, spherically symmetric solutions and for vacuum and also for a spherically symmetric star uh, until Kruskal in the 60s that and where things were finally clarified and the nature of this geometry was completely clear. And why is it that, I mean, it was completely clear that it represents, the vacuum solution represents a spherically symmetric black hole. So I wrote some notes, which are almost personal notes, I mean, notes that are based on a very nice paper by Israel from 1987. So I wrote like a resume of that paper and uh, I put it in the chat. I'm not sure if you can see it because I did it before we started. But I think Pietro will put it back. Can you do that, Pietro? Um, if not, I, you remind me and, and I'll do it at the end of the... Yeah, I was trying to do it. I haven't you, succeeded yet. I, I thought drag and drop would work in the chat. But... Okay, Re remind me at the end and I'll do it, okay? Yeah, I, I have succeeded. It's coming. Ah, you, you succeeded. Okay, great. So these are, the notes are written for my for a course I give here, uh, there are plenty of sp spelling mistakes. It's not ready for, and so it's just take it for you, okay? Um, but it describes the long history of the discussion around what happens at R equal to 2M that I find very interesting. And as I said, it's completely based on this paper of Israel with of course some personal opinions maybe expressed in the way the notes are written. Okay, so when L, is sufficiently large, 
then the potential looks like that. And it looks a little bit in this, in this region here, like the Newtonian potential. If you didn't have the, the um, Newtonian potential that asymptotes to some arbitrary, co some constant that we put by hand. So in the Newtonian case, you have a minimum, but you don't have a maximum. The um, <clears throat> centrifugal barrier wins as you approach i equal to zero, while here the relativistic correction wins. And so if you send the particle with sufficient amount of energy, if the energy is below this critical value, then the particle would, would go around without falling into the black hole. If the energy is above this critical value, then the particle will be absorbed by the black, it will fall into the region R less than 2m, which corresponds to being absorbed by the black hole. So, but in the Schwarzschild case, so we have the possibility of stable circular orbits. So if you place the system right here, the particle here with this level of energy right there, then the particle will, go, will turn around the black hole or the spherical star in, in a circular orbit. This is a stable circular orbit. If we perturb it, by the way, if you do the theory of small perturbations around it, you're gonna get the elliptical orbits. And uh, if, this point, if L is low enough so that this point approaches the strong field regime, then you can find explicitly in a very simple calculation that I leave as an exercise, the expression for the um, um, precession of the orbits that to leading order explains the precession of Mercury. But in addition, because of the relativistic corrections, you have also this uh, um, stable, unstable, sorry, circular orbits here. Okay. <clears throat> Most, all of the tests of, uh, of the, the, the first, the original test of general relativity can always be phrased by analyzing this motion in the central potential. So let's look briefly at null geodesics. So we take kappa equals zero. If you take kappa equals zero, then the potential V looks like is, is given by this expression, just the one I wrote before when you set kappa to zero. And so it looks like the following thing up. Uh, so. Something like that, again, as always, R equal to two M is where the potential goes through zero this point, we have an extremum there. So we can have unstable circular orbits of photons. And this corresponds to the so-called photon sphere R equal to 3m. And this is something you can easily get by just deriving this potential and setting it to zero. In fact, the value of the potential V at 3m is, as you can easily calculate, given by L squared divided by twice times 27 M squared. So if you have the system right there, so this would be equal to an energy. So this would be a critical situation because if you send the particle with an energy below that, that means that the photon will be scattered without absorption. It will do something like that. It, it will get to some point of closest approach are not here. And then it would just scatter back out. So this is something like that. But if you send the particle with more and more and energy, high, higher energy, or something that would be more clear to interpret what's going on is the impact parameter. If the impact parameter is smaller, then uh, the particle is absorbed by the black hole. So these are the two possibilities. So let's look at this critical situation. The critical situation is when you are exactly at that value of the energy. So this is E critical, oh, sorry. E critical divided by two, E critical square divided by two. So these two go away. So the critic, this is the critical value of the angular momentum. So the critical uh, situation 
is given by uh, the condition that L critical divided by E critical square equals 27 M square. And we'll see what that means in a moment. So let me just copy this. slide and uh, this page and erase all this here because we want to understand what this condition means. So um, consider the spherical star here and the motion of the photon. Ha. Okay, something like, so it asymptotes doesn't look like asymptoting anything. Okay, sorry. I mean, you're gonna, this is the best I can do now. So there is a point of closest approach and there is a direct, an asymptotic direction in which this photon is being scattered, okay? So think of it being very, very far away. And so you can define what is very uh, natural in scattering theory the notion of impact parameter. So very far away, you recover all the physics of special relativity. The space time is asymptotically flat. So the impact parameter B is just the distance, the distance between, well, the shooting direction of the photon and the, and the symmetry uh, axis. Uh, so this impact parameter B allows me to write asymptotically, if I am sufficiently far away, we see that the angular momentum of this photon is gonna be given by uh, the impact parameter B times its velocity in the radial direction, which is minus R dot. Why minus? Because uh, I mean, I'm using the convention that angular momentum is positive in going out of the page, okay? And also, I am using that, you know, uh, yeah, the velocity is minus r dot. This photon is sh being shot towards the, uh, the small r direction. So that's what angular momentum is as at infinity. And what is it? So remember, this is a constant of motion. It has always the same value, but at infinity it has to be given by the standard version of angular momentum, the standard expression of angular momentum. Similarly, the energy at infinity, remember, is just given by the zero component of the momentum there, which is T dot, right? One minus two M, E was one minus two M over R times T dot, but at infinity, all this factor becomes one. This is the energy per unit mass in special relativity, far away from the strong field regime. And now because kappa is equal to zero, this is a photon, then we must have that, you know, T minus T square, T dot square plus R dot square must be zero. And so T dot better be equal to minus R dot because this is a future direct particle. So T dot has to be positive. And so that's why we need this minus sign. And from all this, we conclude that uh, the impact parameter B can be written from just this uh, condition, you know, dividing one by the other, we find that B is given by L over E. So this critical condition here corresponds to or sets a value of a critical value of the, the critical value of the parameter B critical square. So this tells us that if we shoot the photon with the impact parameter below this critical value, then the photon will be absorbed if the impact parameter is higher than this critical value the uh, photon will be scattered. So this gives us a total cross section of the black hole, which is given by pi times this B critical uh, square. So this is pi times 27 pi times 27 M square. So for the sun, for a black hole of the mass and B critical is just a square root of 27 times M. For a black hole of solar mass, I thought I wrote this, but I remember by heart, is about 15 kilometers. 
remember that the Schwarzschild radius, so R equal to two M for um, solar mass black hole is about three kilometers. Okay, so this is the apparent size of the, of the black hole as an absorber of photons. It's much bigger than just the Schwarzschild radius. And this gives us a total cross section for uh, photon motion. Of course, you can go ahead and actually study the motion of these photons uh, when they are subcritical, when they are deviated like that. And uh, it's very nice. You can actually solve analytically the um, expression for the orbit of the photons. And by studying this expression, you can actually find the basic equations of gravitational lensing. And you, you can also explain one more of the tests of general relativity, the deviation of light. All right, so this uh, ends our discussion of uh, the nature of geodesics in the Schwarzschild solution. We're going to use these geodesics later for interpreting some of the properties of the geometry. But for the moment, this was just a review of how you solve this, this, these equations. One important thing that I want to say, that I forgot to say, is that uh, once you have this constants of motion, in the case of Schwarzschild, it might be hard to integrate the equations of to integrate this and get you know, explicitly the geodesics. And in some, I mean, you can use numerical methods and so on. But what is, what is very important is that we know everything about the local properties of geodesics. Actually, we know we could compute things like redshift and etc. So we know exactly the four velocity because we know t dot, r dot, and phi dot at any place in space time thanks to these conservation laws. So we have all the local information that we need that will often be very important to interpreting what's going on. And this is also true even in the most sophisticated background that given by the Kerr metric, where integrating the geodesics is much more involved, much more complicated. However, these conservation laws still will be very interesting, very insightful in analyzing the nature of the geometry analytically, because locally we do know everything about what this uh, geodesics what the, the four velocity for these test bodies is. Maybe this sounds a bit abstract and you don't know exactly what I'm talking about, but we're gonna come back to applications and you'll see what I mean. All right. So next subject, very important because we have to be able to interpret this line element, which is the simplest case of a black hole in uh, geometric terms and globally. We want to talk about black hole as a region of no escape. And for that, we need to know the Schwarzschild geometry from a global perspective. So the next step in that direction is to resolve the problem at R equal to 2M. So let me write the metric again. Now, because, okay, so the question is what happens at R equal to 2M, which seems like a problem because uh, some components become zero, components of the metric, some components blow up there. But, you know, as we know, as you know, this is just an apparent singularity, and we're going to do that explicitly. Now, all the problems are happening in the RT plane because of spherical symmetry. And because of spherical symmetry, we can analyze the, the, what's going on by simply forgetting about you know, this transverse part of the metric. So in concentrate on the two dimensional, on the two dimensional metric, on the 2D toy metric, uh, if we solve the issue, what's happening at R equal to 2M, then we can restore, we can apply what we have learned to the four dimensional line element immediately. So let me concentrate on this two dimensional line, line element and the nice thing about any 2D um, space time is that there is a recipe. There is a recipe to uh, eliminate, uh, to find physically defined coordinates 
that by construction cannot have coding problems. And with this recipe, we're gonna get rid of the problem at R equal to two M. So what is the recipe in, in words? In two any two dimensional metric is conformally flat. And so in, therefore in two dimensions, null geodesics are like null geodesics of Minkowski spacetime. Now null geodesics of Minkowski spacetime separate, no, define a perfectly regular coordinate grid. So if we could adapt coordinates to the grid defined by null geodesics, then we know that we must have coordinates which are well behaved and that any possible apparent problem will have to disappear if we adapt the coordinates to this coordinate grid. So now, so the only thing we have to do is to find parameters along this null geodesics, right moving, so outgoing geodesics and ingoing geodesics in the RT plane. We have to define affine parameters, parameters along this geodesic which are well behaved. Now, parameters can be totally arbitrary and therefore they can introduce coordinate problems again, singularities again. But as I said at the beginning, affine parameters are defined only up to linear transformations. And so affine parameters can never introduce uh, problems, uh, pro uh, singularities in the coordinate system. So that's the recipe. Just go to this null coordinates, find affine parameters, and you're done. So let's do it. So we have a two-dimensional geometry there. We factor out one minus two M over R. And so now you see that this starts looking like a conformally flat thing. This is what we were looking for. The conformal factor times the Minkowski two-dimensional metric if we were able to solve, if we introduce a new coordinate where dr star is given by dr over one minus two m over r, and this coordinate is called the tortoise coordinate, r star, you can integrate this, and if you set the integration constants appropriately, then you find the uh, customary uh, expression, which is r plus 2m log of r over 2m minus 1. Now, uh, so in this new coordinates, the metric is as advertised conformally flat. And so now we know what the next step is. We use uh, null coordinates. We introduce u retarded time t minus r star, which would be constant along this white null geodesics. And we introduce v equals to t plus r star, which will be now, which will be constant along this ingoing geodesics. So this is outgoing and this is ingoing geodesics. So in terms of these null coordinates, now you have to think of one minus two m over r as a function of the new coordinates implicitly given. I'm not gonna write it. It's hard to write explicitly because of this expression, but we'll talk about it in a moment. So one minus two M over R times minus du dv. And now it's now by just, uh, you know, solving for, uh, you see, solving for this conformal factor, you find the following expression. So in fact, this expression here is the same thing as what I'm writing now, one minus two M over R it's given by 2m over r times e to the minus r over 2m times e to the r star over 2m. So this is a simple, I mean, it's immediate, right? From here to here. So the nice thing about that is we haven't written r as a function of r star as one might want to. I mean, the, that's hard to do analytically because of this uh, complexity of the expression. However, we have split this, which is the conformal factor, which happens to have some funny pr problem at r equal to 2m, it vanishes, in terms of a piece that is perfectly well behaved at r equal to 2m, it's just a constant, times the piece that should have the problem that we can write. So this piece here, 
can be written in terms of these new coordinates as e to the um, v minus u over 4m. So by doing that, then the metric becomes uh, 2m over r e to the minus r over 2m, perfectly well behaved 10 times e to the v times e to the v over 4m times e to the minus u over 4m times du dv times minus du dv. And now we see the solution by inspection. So we could say things and do it carefully and find the affine parameters, but we don't have time here, but you just look at this and you see what the solution is. You can introduce Kruskal coordinates. <clears throat> you can introduce new coordinates. capital U equal to E to the minus U over 4M with a minus sign here in capital V equal to E to the V over 4M. And so the metric becomes, all this factor of the metric here becomes just like, a, all this becomes, well, there is a 16M square term that comes from the Jacobian. Uh, so you get 32M cubed over r times e to the minus r over 2m, all this implicitly defined in terms of u and v times minus du dv, which you recognize as the flat metric. <clears throat> dt squared minus dt squared plus dx squared if you define, you know, u equal to t minus x and capital V as t plus x. So you sort of undo the trick of retarded and <coughs> advanced time. So at the end of the day, your initial metric is just given by some well-behaved conformal factor at, at, at r equal to 2m times something that is perfectly well-behaved. Well, there are some subtleties at the horizon that I'm gonna to have to go very quickly over here. Um, <clears throat> but everything is contained in these expressions. So if you write the coordinate transformation, if you write the expressions we had in the previous page, then you find that minus U times capital V is the same thing as X squared minus T squared. That's just by definition and this is given by r over 2m minus one times e to the r over 2m. This is again the relationship between r star, if you want, and t and, and, and r written in terms of the Kruskal coordinates. And then you find also the t can be written as 4m tangent hyperbolic tangent inverse hyperbolic tangent of t over x. Okay, and with that, we will be able to interpret what's happening. So uh, you get the maximal extension of the Schwarzschild geometry that looks like, like this. So this is, um, Here we are in the, T X coordinates, capital T, capital X coordinates. So this is, well, maybe I should have written like, this is the T axis and this is the X axis. R equal to M corresponds to the place, if I put r equal to 2m, this gets zero. So we get x squared minus t squared equal to zero, which corresponds to u times v equal to zero. And this is exactly these diagonals at 45 degrees. So these are, uh, these uh, r equal to 2m surfaces. r equal to constant surfaces, which have r greater than 2m, 
they correspond to the orbits of the Killing field. And so outside, as we knew, so for R greater than 2m, they are time-like. So this is these are R equal constant surfaces. They degenerate into these null surfaces as we approach the R equal to 2m region. There is um, there is the interior region, I'm gonna to get to it in a moment. There is the r equal to zero region. If I put r equal to zero here, then we find that x squared minus t squared is equal to one, to minus one. So this corresponds to this uh, hyperboli, which are the place where the gravitational field actually blows up. This is the true singularity inside the black hole. It blows up because you can calculate Cashman coefficients, for example, and any you know curvature scalars that blow up as r goes to zero. So you know this is a true uh, singularity. So the r less than 2m region corresponds to um, <clears throat> this place here. So if you are here, there is no way you can escape out to infinity because a ah, very important thing to, to say that I should have said, remember that the metric is um, conformally flat. So anything radial, any radial thing moving at the speed of light looks as moving at 45 degrees in my Tx um, diagram, okay? So uh, the light cone is everywhere here at 45 degrees. So if we are outside, the light cone looks like that. If we are here, the light cone looks like this. And so we see that if we are in here, there is no way respecting relativity, not moving faster than light to escape to the outside region. So this region here is called the black hole region. This is an asymptotically flat outside region. There is another asymptotically flat. All this has to be analyzed carefully if we had time, but uh, there is another asymptotically flat region where the orbits of the killing go the other way around. This is very easy to see why. Uh, so the t equal constant surfaces as follows. So the t equal constant surfaces from this expression look as straight lines. Like this is the t equal zero surface. This is a t equal something, t equals something higher surface. So you see that as t goes to higher values, then the d by dt orbits, you know, here point upwards d by dt, t grows in this direction. But as you make t grow here, you make you go downwards here. So d by dt goes the other way around in this other region. <clears throat> if you look at one of these surfaces, any of those surfaces look the same because there is an isopentry mapping you from one t equal constant surface to another one. Remember, the space time is stationary. The killing field maps you from one to the other. And so, uh, this, you can analyze the geometry of this by placing yourself here. Remember, each point here corresponds to a sphere because we dropped the, the transverse di direction. This is an S2. And each point here is identified by some value of R and the value of R is related to the area of, this, of these spheres. So now imagine that you move from this point to this point. Of course, nobody can move in this way. You're moving in a space-like direction. You go from point one to two to three, four, until you reach this point and you keep going and so on. So it's easy to see that as you go away, space time becomes, so the t equal constant surface is an Euclidean geometry that becomes flat asymptotically. So you start from something that looks like R3. And then uh, as you move towards this point, you get to the R equal to 2M region. So you're actually the area of these surfaces is shrinking until you get to this uh, 0.5. And from there on, the area starts growing again. So the geometry of these t equal constant surfaces looks look like one of these uh, einstein rosen bridge or wormholes. So that connects one asymptotically flat region with the other. So quickly, uh, the killing field orbit, so the r equal constant surfaces inside look like this. Wait, this uh, arrow should be the opposite. 
And uh, so this region here is called the, this is the black hole region, this is the white hole region, which is just the time symmetric. Remember that everything is, has this discrete symmetry, T going to minus T. So anything you find to the future, you find it also in the past. So you have a black hole region with a boundary, which is the singularity, and you have a white hole region whose boundary in the past is a singularity. Okay, so how much of all this is actually physical? Mm. In astrophysical situations, very little of this is physical. So if you think of a space-time made from gravitational collapse, and these are the only black holes that we actually know. Uh, sorry, there are some things I should have said. Uh, I didn't finish saying, so let me come back to this. So this portion of the horizon here, if I, like, uh, if I look at the portion here, then it looks like it's a null surface whose cross sections have constant area because we are always at r equal to 2n. So this is the black hole horizon. Similarly for, for a portion here. So if I look at this point here, this looks like a sphere such that the outgoing light remains trapped at a given area. So the expansion of outgoing light is zero. But if I look at the ingoing light shine shown by this uh, 2D surfaces, then it will go in. So this will be ingoing light. It just shrinks normally. In Minkowski space-time, outgoing light, you know, expands and ingoing light shrinks. Here, the gravitational field stops outgoing light from uh, expanding. And this is why this is called a trapped or marginally trapped surface, because one of the expansions is zero. Something similar happens for this part of the horizon. There is something very, very funny happening here, which is a place, basically this is called the bifurcating uh, point or bifurcating sphere. It corresponds to this minimal surface here in the, the, the neck of the throat. This point is a sphere, which has the property that outgoing light gets trapped. So the expansion is zero and ingoing light is also trapped. So this is, an extremely relativistic situation that happens at this um, bifurcating point. All right, so how much of all this is physical? In astrophysical situations, you expect that in the past you will have some matter. Hey, yes. Before you move on, maybe. Can you complete the description of this picture? There was a question coming from the audience. Um, the diagram is not compactified yet. So what happens? Are there time-like trajectories that do not fall into the black holes? How would you see those ones in this picture? The okay. question is- Whoever is asking this question has to wait a little bit because I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the compactification of all this, okay? And we'll see clearly. But at least what you see clearly here is what I said. If you were in this region, it is clear that you, by causality, you cannot go out. Now, I mean, it's also obvious that if I am here outside, there are time like curves that extend all the way to infinity with the intuitive no notion of infinity, which means moving very far away in this direction. That is also obvious from the picture. Causality does not prevent me from, you know, moving away to large values of R. Of course, all these are just pictures and it will become, they will become totally clear. In, yeah, that's know. right. Careful, your, your white arrow is now bending slightly more than 45. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Let me but I hope this answers the question clearly. There are trajectories that uh, you will see do not cross the red line, but are still time-like. Well, I, well, I mean, there is, uh, in fact, uh, more precisely and very precisely, one of these blue trajectories never cross the, the red line and they are time-like. The d by dt orbits for r greater than 2m never cross the red line. So it suffices to be, you know, let's be sufficiently far away. It suffices, you, so you are standing there, you have a star, there is some gravitational pull, but you light on your rockets and you start moving away at, at the speed less than the speed of light. So you will be deviating from one of these orbits 
jumping from one R equal constant to another one is obviously I can do it respecting causality. And so I will be slowly resting in a way and escaping out. So even if I don't do anything, I will never cross the red line. If I am on one, I mean, I have to do one thing. I have to be on my rocket. I have to have enough fuel so that I remain on one of these blue lines. Or I can be a geodesic. I mean, the best thing is to look at the geodesic equations. We have solved all the geodesics. So you can look at geodesics that actually go, I mean, they are not straight in these coordinates, but uh, so. You can just solve the geodesic. We have solved the geodesic equation. We have seen that there are solutions that come from infinity and go back to infinity, right? Those are, for example, these orbits of in scattering theory. That's the proof. Okay? Yeah, very, I think it's very clear. Please go on. All right. I am panicking with time. How, how much time do I have? Well, uh, half, an, half an hour for sure. Maybe. Okay. Not much more than that, so that we can have some further questions at the end. Okay, so what about the previous, how, how much of the previous pictures are real or physically relevant? So in astrophysical situations, what you have in the past is some matter, some spherical star. So let's assume we have a spherically symmetric star so that everything is spherically symmetric. Birkhoff's theorem tells me that outside of the matter distribution, outside, the outside has to be isomorphic to some piece. I mean, it has to be just the Schwarzschild solution that we are talking about. So the outside of the matter is something that I can match to some region of the previous picture, right? So the outside will correspond to, let's put blue, sorry for putting so much information in one. So the, all this part to the left of this blue line will be occupied by matter and therefore I have to look at the solution of Einstein's equations with sources there. So everything that is to the left of this line does not apply anymore, okay? And everything that is to the right will be perfectly isomorphic to my picture, to what I, to, 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 to this part, to, to the outside region. The blue line is this one, the limit of the star. And, uh, you know, we know that we have we can cook up examples of matter solution, solutions inside solutions. We know that they can be perfectly regular inside, and so and eventually develop the singularity. So space time will look like this. There is no more Einstein Rosen beach, br uh, bridge. There is no um, <clears throat> wormhole. There is no white hole. There is only so the astrophysical situation is very time asymmetric. The past. It's very different from the future. In the past, we have weak fields, diluted matter that eventually form a star. The star gets old, fuel runs, it runs out of fuel and eventually collapses into a black hole. And the future is very different from the past. Gravitational field is strong, trapped surfaces develop and a singularity appears. This time asymmetry is at the heart of, in my opinion, and I will, will not have time to actually develop this very, very much, but this is a very important conceptual thing. This time is asymmetry is tied to the time, the inherent time asymmetry of thermodynamics. This is one of the first hints that these objects might have some, uh, might have shared some properties with thermodynamical systems. All right, so the outside is perfectly isomorphic to, um, <clears throat> to what we see saw before. So this line here is just the horizon, but the horizon is the causal barrier. So all this part of this line is also the horizon. And I should have said this, the outside corresponds to R equal to 2M. The inside, it depends on the inside solution. So, but I can draw a picture, this black hole horizon. So the portion that is outside so from point say one to point uh, two, so this uh, I'm dropping one dimension. This is the sphere at point one. This is the sphere at point two. 
the horizon is a non-expanding thing. And from there to the past, it will look like generically like a surface that starts at a point in the center of the star. So inside the star, very close to this region here where the horizon appears, this looks very much like a light hole of special relativity. Now the horizon is a teleological notion. This is something you've heard many times, I suppose. And to see that, imagine that we send some additional matter a spherical shell of matter a bit later, like this. So now uh, the part, so the intermediate part here will be isomorphic to some Schwarzschild solution, but the outside of the mat, the star and the shell will also be isomorphic to some uh, Schwarzschild solution with a larger mass. And so there will be a horizon that will be placed here outside the other one at are equal to 2m plus delta m, which is the mass of the shell that we have thrown in. And now what is the black hole horizon? Now it changes because matter has fall, fallen in, the black hole horizon now will be all this, which here will look like, let me, I need more space. So let me shorten this part. So here we had matter that fell in the star and developed a singularity, but now there is more matter, shell falling in here. And so what we have is that the horizon, the Schwarzschild horizon, the R equal to two M plus, uh, R equal to two M plus delta M is outside, so the true horizon now will be something like like this. It will be a null surface again that starts like a <clears throat> light cone. Here, it will be slightly outside the r equal to two m region because it has to expand up to the r equal to two m. So r equal to two m plus delta m surface. So unless you tell me the whole history of space time, I can never tell you where the horizon of the black hole is. So if I had not told you that there was going to be a shell falling into the black hole, then you would have thought that the horizon was here, but you would have been wrong because even living here in your rocket with a lot of fuel, you might have thought you are free, you can go away because you're not inside the r equal to 2m region, but you would have been wrong because you were inside already of the horizon of the black hole that will, that will form with the subsequent um, falling of matter. So unless you don't, you know the whole history of the space time from the beginning to the end of times, you cannot know what the black hole is or what, what, where the black hole horizon is located. And this is why the definition of black hole necessitates a little bit of a technical tool that we're going to discuss uh, next soon, uh, which is this compactification and conformal diagrams and, and, and Penrose diagrams. So we need to talk about infinity. We need to talk about the global structure of the space time. We need to know space time for all times to be able to know where the black hole is or where the horizon is located. So these pieces of things are, you know, have a name also, they're called apparent horizons. So locally, you might think, this is a horizon. There are some local notions that you can use to define where the surfaces are located. For example, trap, marginally trapped surfaces. But this does not define the frontier of uh, the region of no escape, which is always something global about something that necessitates the, no, uh, the knowledge of the whole of the space time. All right. So before talking about compactification, and I'm not sure if I will have time for doing this. Uh, let me tell you about something that I find also very uh, instructive and important for discussions in quantum gravity. And this is about the geometry inside the black hole. So let, let us, you know, go into the inside. Uh, we have 
the singularity that looks like this. I'm still in this. Uh, so keep in mind, we are in this coordinates, uh, crucial coordinates, if you want, and an R equal constant surface. I don't like my picture. OK, that's what, what that one is better. So in the R equal constant surfaces, uh, look like a hyperbola. So this is an R less than 2M. So we are inside. Now, uh, this is an R equal constant surface, R equal to some R zero less than 2M. We are inside. Now, uh, remember this R equal constant surfaces are the orbits of the killing field D by DT. So the killing field here there is a translational killing field that goes like that. This is our psi killing field. The stationarity killing field becomes space-like inside. And in addition to that, each one of these points, recall, corresponds to, to a sphere. And on the sphere, we have our three killing fields, right? Of spherical symmetry. And so on. So that means that if I am at one point, at one sphere here, I can go to another sphere here along the orbits of a killing field, the time translation killing field, which is basically here. Not only that, if I, had, I, if I am at some arbitrary point on the sphere here, I can go to another sphere here and move to an arbitrary point on the sphere following also orbits of killing fields. That means that these R equal constant surfaces are homogeneous. The geometry does not change when I move around. No matter how I move around this three-dimensional surface, the geometry is always the same. So uh, I can think of time evolution, evolution towards, so there is a natural notion of evolution here given by evolving into the norm, in the direction normal to these R equal constant surfaces. So let me call them UA, because if this is normalized, this represents a certain type of observers, observers that are uh, falling into, into the black hole. So into the black hole singularity, sorry. And the time, their time evolution or their life can be represented by an evolution which is analogous to a cosmological, homogeneous cosmological evolution. So inside of a spherically symmetric black hole, we can describe evolution towards the singularity by uh, a cosmological model that is homogeneous, but it's not isotropic. So it's not like our FR, FR, FLRW models that we use to describe our universe at large scales. This one is not, is homogeneous, but not as isotropic because I mean, it's obvious that it's not the same moving along this, uh, psi direction that moving in the transversal directions. For example, the orbits in the transversal directions are compact, but the orbits in the, uh, in the psi directions are, are non-compact. So in fact, if I look at that, in, in, if I drop one dimension, this R equal constant surface looks like a cylinder uh, because I'm dropping uh, one transversal di direction, of course. It would be hyper cylinder. It would be like the topology of it is S3 cross, sorry, S2 cross R. So it's a three dimensional surface. So uh, D by DT, so Xi, the killing field uh, produces translations in this, in this way. And the spherical killings like Xi produces rotations around this cylinder. Now, uh, as you, I want to prove the following statement, I mean, I mean, you can prove it uh, carefully yourself. As you move towards, as you evolve towards the singularity by jumping from one R equal constant surface to another R equal constant surface with smaller radius, so when you go from here to here, I mean, when you evolve from one to another, as you approach the singularity, then something very uh, interesting happens which has some important physical consequences that we will discuss later, uh, you get 
this cosmology is such that you get expansion of the universe in this direction and contraction of the universe in the transversal direction. This is pretty obvious that you get contraction in transversal direction because the area of this uh, spheres, it's getting smaller and smaller. Remember that the area through the line element is related to the, to the, sorry, yeah, the area of the spheres is related to the radius and the radius is shrinking to zero. Now, what is less obvious is that you're getting this infinite, that you're getting this stretching in the opposite direction. So it's different from a big crunch in cosmology, in FRW cosmology, where I, because of isopotro isotropy, you can either have expansion or collapsing or, or, or you, have, you can either have a big bang or a big crunch. Here you have a little bit of a two. In the transversal direction, you get, you get a big crunch and in the, in the other direction you get, an, well, I, couldn't, I wouldn't call it a big bang, but you have an expansion. The expansion in, in, in transversal direction, contraction in the opposite direction. How do you see this more precisely? I mean, you can do a little calculation. You can look at um, calculation that was done by Salvatore, one of my PhD students, uh, before being my PhD student. So you can look at the sphere here and consider normal geodesics, you know, starting from this sphere. And so how is this initial sphere going to, how is it going to change as you evolve these geodesics to the future? This is controlled by uh, something that is called, uh, by, 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 uh, by the expansion and the shear of the geodesic congruence. So if I write the Geodesic, so these geodesics are normal to this UA. Uh, uh, these geodesics are defined with initial conditions related to this UA. So the gradient of UB can be written, can be decomposed into its trace part. HAB is the induced metric of these article constant surfaces, plus the trace free part of this tensor, which is called the shear. This is the expansion, this is the shear. Theta tells you how the volume, how the volume of this sphere, initial sphere, this pencil of geodesics changes with time. So theta is given by V dot over V with proper time, the affine parameter along these geodesics. This theta happens to be proportional to this negative and diverges as you approach. Uh, R equals zero, it goes like that. So this is telling you that, uh, you know, the expansion is blowing up because you are shrinking towards this singularity, but you get more information if you look at the structure of sigma, this is a tensor now. And if you go to an orthonormal frame, this tensor sigma, it looks like some constant alpha times, positive constant alpha times M over R square root times one over R again, times the tensor that has eigenvalues two, minus one and minus one. So this is exactly telling you, the shear tells you how an initially spherical pencil of geodesics deforms into a, an ellipsoid. And what is the rate of deformation in the principal axis of this uh, ellipsoid? And it's telling you that in two directions, this sphere is shrinking these are the two negative eigenvalues you have here. And in the other direction, it is expanding, which is exactly confirming our interpretation of uh, this cosmology inside the black hole. Okay, so that's key for some things I want to say later. And in particular is key for what I want to say now. Um, so another thing that has to do with this and very important that I, I managed to say this, because then, then we can start from a, so this is our article constant surface, and this is our observer, this uh, cosmological observer falling into the singularity. Imagine now that somebody sends a photon from the outside, a particle, a massless particle with tangent vector Okay, A, so we can ask the question, what is the frequency omega measured by this um, observer, suicidal observer falling into the singularity? The frequency is given by minus K AUA 
the inner product uh, between the wave, wave number k is assumed to be a geodesic, so a freely falling photon, say. And by using the conserved quantities I gave you at the beginning, the fact that you know k locally everywhere in the space-time in terms of the conserved quantities, you find the following interesting result. The omega measured by this natural observer falling into a singularity depends on the energy of the photon and the angular momentum of the photon, the two conserved quantities, and it goes like L squared for small r, it goes like L squared or r squared plus r times E squared over 2m plus corrections order of r over m squared. Okay. So as, as you approach the singularity, a funny thing happens. Imagine that you had a photon that had zero angular momentum. If you didn't look at this term, if you had zero angular momentum, this term wouldn't be there. And so what you find is that the frequency measured by this local observer falling into a singularity goes to zero. So the photons that fall from the outside with zero angular momentum are infinitely redshifted as you approach the singularity. That's again, that's again, and has, it has an intuit, intuitive reason for that is the infinite expansion in the transversal direction. Because remember that E has to do with the conserved quantity associated with translations along the Keeling field side. But if you look at the generic photon, a photon, a general photon, an arbitrary photon will have some angular momentum and then the frequency, the proper frequency measured by this and the wavelength measured by the suiciding observer here will just blow up as you approach the singularity. And this is again, very intuitive. So we have, uh, you know, if the oscillations in this direction get stretched and redshifted, but the oscillations in the transversal direction, which have to do with the angular momentum conserved quantity, they get infinitely blue shifted. And that's something I want you to keep in mind for future discussion, okay? But again, all this is related to the properties of the, 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 the uh, dynamical properties of this cosmological evolution inside of the black hole. All right, how much time do I have, uh, Simone, at this point? 10 more minutes. Uh, all right, all right, all right, all right. So let me go on, maybe I will finish. Can I have a quick question now or at the end? Uh, About yes, the question now can be good. Yeah, so if it can be good, the uh, question is to see that the radius of the spheres are reducing when you move towards uh, UA, is it necessary to calculate the shear or can we see it before that through another simpler analysis? Um, no, the shear, the shear, uh, uh, I mean, the, the result I gave you comes from a direct calculation, right? And now that the shear would have to have uh, one eigenvalue that is positive and two that are negative, I think is intuitive from the fact that you have this um, expansion. Okay, the, in the way I presented this, the way to see that you have an infinite expansion. Oh, this is really bad news. Uh, you lost my, you don't see me and you don't see the screen anymore? Yeah, it looks like it crashed. Okay, do you see it again? Yeah, we do. Yeah, but what crashed is my tablet. Wait, I'm gonna mm -hmm. unplug it and plug it back. Yeah, but I think the question was simply was, can we see that the spheres are shrinking without the need to introduce the shear tensor? Is there something? Uh, yeah, similar... It depends what spheres are you talking about. If you're talking yeah. about my tablet doesn't work, it's amazing. It happens always at the end of my. <laughs> so if you look at if you if you're talking about these transversal spheres, they shrink because their area is proportional to, you know, r square. And r is becoming zero here. Exactly. So that this sphere shrink is is obvious. Now, I mean. Because of that, because of that, it should be obvious that if on one of these spheres you take a piece of it, right? Now I'm talking about another sphere. I, I, I'm talking about a pencil of geodesics. 
but it would have some intersection with these spheres, which is, uh, uh, you know, circle. It is obvious that the area of the circle will shrink because it's part of the sphere that is shrinking. Uh, and how now, about the transverse direction? And in the transverse direction, I don't know of any intuitive uh, way of seeing that you have an infinite expansion right now. There, there, there should be one. Uh, let me think about it. I'll give you an, an answer next time, okay? Yes. Maybe but, the, the tidal effects on the deviation of the geodesics. I mean, no, if you want a technical answer, it's just, it's just this, right? It's the, the, the way in which the... Yeah, yeah, no, I was thinking about an intuitive. Uh, yeah. No, there is an intuitive one also. I mean, I just have to uh, be careful on how you define the stretching. I mean, you have to take two co-moving observers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, it's easy. Now, now I have the intuition. Okay, take two co-moving observers. One of these, Tung, is following there, and the other one is following here. Now use the metric to compute their distance a bit later, and you will find the distance that they actually separate. So the distance in this level is higher than the distance here. This is the stretching I'm talking about. And why? This is because uh, the... Uh, because of the form of the metric. Okay, I, I prepare this for next time to show it, okay? I mean, you, you can just use the metric to, to compute this, that co-moving, namely these guys that are following the orbits of D by, uh, you know, gradient R, the normal to the surfaces are actually separating as they approach, they're separating in the, in the transversal direction, in the longitudinal direction as they approach the singularity. Right. So, so if the students are familiar with the geodesic deviation equation, that's the that's one way to see it. That is. Uh, yeah, but this uh, is. But then, if you use the geodesic deviation equation, well, if you use the Ray Chadur equation, it would be again you're going to get back to sigma. But if you write the, uh, the geodesic deviation equation, yes, you should see this in in the behavior of the Riemann curvature uh, components that are appropriate for this type of geodesics. All right, so, so we have my, from your tablet. I don't know what to do. My tablet collapsed. I'm going to plug it. Uh, let me try something. Otherwise, this also maybe if it doesn't work, maybe we can open for more questions. So it's not a problem. Let us just know. Try one more time. OK, so I quit. Yeah, now it's working. So I just killed the application, started again. So we were here. Okay. So let me try to keep going. So because we have too many things to cover, only six hours. So the complexification. Now we're going to talk about global aspects. So how do you? So we start from an example. The compactification of the plane. So if you take the R two plane, and uh, think of a, a sphere placed suitably placed on the R2 plane. And now take, fix a point in the sphere, the North Pole. And now you have a natural map from points in the two plane to points on the sphere defined by taking a straight line that goes from the North Pole to the point of, of your choice in, and it intersects the surface at some point, uh, the, the, the sphere at some point that has coordinates theta and phi and here you get coordinates r and phi if you use polar coordinates. And you can use the same phi, you can you know, sort of uh, choose things so that the phi is the same. Now, the metric, this is called the stereographic projection. So the metric of the plane can be written as, let me write it here. Well, it's just dx squared plus dy squared, which is nothing but r squared d phi squared plus d r squared in polar coordinates. Now, by looking at this map here, you, have, you can actually <clears throat> you know, map r and theta 
r and phi into theta and phi, and the map looks like this. So r is given a little bit of geometry gives you this sine of theta divided by one minus cosine of theta. And of course, phi equal phi. We have tuned things so that phi is the same. And so you find that the metric of the plane can be written as one over one minus cosine theta squared times d theta squared plus d phi squared sine squared phi. And here you identify, you discover the metric of the unit sphere. So you see that, let me call this because this is standard notation ds bar square. So this is the unphysical uh, metric. So you see that from this relationship, you find that you could write the metric of the sphere as a conformal factor, one minus times the metric of the plane. So this is called the unphysical metric. of a compact space, and physical space, time, and this is the physical metric. So now, I mean, assuming that you are interested in physics associated to things you do in a plane. Now, you are mapping a non-compact space, the plane, into a compact model space-time, uh, which is the sphere, where infinity actually, so points very far away towards infinity move, when you move the point towards infinity, then this intersection moves to, towards the North Pole. So in fact, infinity is mapped to the North Pole of this sphere. So what is infinity? Infinity must be the place where this, conformal factor, which by the way, we're gonna write as omega square. So infinity geometrically corresponds to the point where omega is equal to zero. And of course, omega has to vanish at, at infinity because you're mapping infinite, infinitely long distances in the physical metric to finite distances in a compact space-time metric. So in a compact space, all distance will be finite. So it better happens that this omega kills this infinity. So omega must vanish at infinity. Here, infinity is represented by this North Pole. And so you have a conformal transform relation between some toy metric, which contains infinity, and the physical metric where infinity is nowhere, in fact. So if you want to give a precise meaning to infinity, it's nice to look at this compactification. Moreover, if you were interested in physics that is conformally invariant, namely if you were interested in this very simple case, for example, in things like angles, you know, then you find that angles are preserved by conformal transformations. So the angle, if you were only interested as ang by angles, you can perfectly do physics either with the model space-time or with the physical space-time, as far as you're talking about angles, is just the same. And so the advantage you have is that in this mapping your non-compact space-time to this compact model space-time with the conformal transformation, in addition, you can even do geometric uh, differential geometry close to this, to infinity. You can give a um, differential geometry, you can, keep doing differential geometry at a place that does not exist in your physical metric, but it represents infinity. And it's right someplace in, in, in your uh, compact model space. And this has great advantages when you talk about some structures. In particular, it has a lot of advantages in gravity if you wanna talk about infinity and asymptotic conditions. So let's do this. Let's do this uh, with the, uh, uh, Minkowski space-time.
So this is the Minkowski space-time written in spherical coordinates. Now you can introduce our friends retarded time t minus r and v t plus r, and the metric becomes minus du dv plus one fourth of v minus u square d omega square. And now we want to do something similar to what we did with the plane. And so believe me that this is the right mapping. There is, the mapping is not unique. There are some, uh, there is some arbitrariness and one can take care of that and one has to remember this, but uh, here we need to be quick. So one possible map, coordinate transformation that will send our physical Minkowski space time into a, an unphysical compact space is the following. We introduce new coordinates, capital R, capital T, in this way, tangent minus one of V minus tangent minus one of U. And now you find that uh, T plus R is constrained to a compact region. It goes between minus pi and pi. This is the, the first good thing. So we are gonna map the whole of space-time, Minkowski space-time to a compact region somewhere and we have to find out what is the metric na uh, nature of that somewhere. So by just doing the coordinate transformation, which is proposed, we find that the Minkowski metric can be written as one plus P square times one plus U square. So divided by four times, times the unphysical metric minus DT square plus, so this is the inverse of the conformal factor, the R square plus sine square of R, D omega square. So here you identify the unit sphere of three spheres. This is the unit sphere of, sorry, the unit, met, the metric of a unit three sphere. This is the metric of a unit two sphere. This thing is the metric of the so-called Einstein universe. I need space, okay. The Einstein universe, it's a Lorentzian space time, it's a, it's a cosmology where nothing happens in the T direction. We always have this unit three sphere metric. So T goes like that, okay. So it's a compact, well, it's non-compact in the T direction, but this restriction here implies that the whole of Minkowski space-time is actually mapped to a compact piece of this, which looks like this. So, okay. Um, I hope you understand the picture. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna cut this picture along. I'm gonna cut the cylinder here and open this up. So in what you find this is the whole of Minkowski space time becomes something that in well, in two dimensions it would look like this. This is slightly misleading in two dimensions. So uh, and I don't have space. Well, the guy down there is called I minus. This point here is called I naught. And it's the same. So this is the analog of the North Pole in the, in the previous Euclidean example. This is called I plus, I minus is down there. Now, uh, bec because this is a conformal transformation, so I should write, um, so this whole thing here is the unphysical metric, ds bar square. So we can write ds bar square equals to omega square times ds square. So this omega is just the inverse of this factor that you find here that you should write in terms of t and i or understand as a function of t, capital T and, and r. And of course it vanishes at the boundary of this compact region. So the whole of Minkowski space-time is mapped to this piece of the Einstein static universe this is called Einstein static universe because this is the geometry he found when he invented the cosmological constant. 
because he wanted the universe not to change in time. Okay, so, uh, but because it's a conformal transformation, now if you look at null mo things moving in Minkowski space time along radial null directions, then they go at 45 degrees in this diagram. What is null in Minkowski space time remains null here. This is conformally invariant information. So these are uh, ingoing and outgoing geodesics. These geodesics reach infinity. These geodesics reach infinity um, in the future on this boundary of your uh, compact region. And these regions are called scribe plus, you know, which in fact, all this is connected. Um, we need another picture. So a better picture is of this compactified Minkowski space-time is to go to spherical coordinates. So now every point here, like in our case of black hole, represents a sphere. So R bigger, when we grow in R, we move away from this, which is the R equals zero line. So I was saying outgoing geodesics move at 45 degrees and they reach future null infinity, ingoing geodesics come from another infinity, which is called past null infinity, and they become outgoing by going through the uh, symmetry axis here in Minkowski. This is I naught is the place where all space-like surfaces, T equal constant surfaces actually meet. And if you look at each of these t equal constant surfaces in the in the Einstein universe, each of them look like like a sphere, a compact sphere. So for each of them, you have a stereographic compatibility of R three, which is exactly of the same nature of our previous example. So future null infinity is where null stuff re gets to infinity. Past null infinity is from where null stuff comes. A time like things all emanate time-like geodesic things. So if you are freely falling in this space time, you start at I plus, I minus, and you end up at I plus. If you accelerate, you can be, you can, you, you are able to reach a null infinity if you are, if you have enough fuel to accelerate towards a scry plus, but you need to accelerate. Geodesics all end here and, and, and start here and end there. So infinity, what is it? Intuitively, from the point of view of inertial observers in Minkowski, so if I am an inertial observer, I go from here to here. I am a geodesic, uh, uh, in geodesic motion. But if I am a geodesic observer, so an inertial observer at sufficiently large r, so for, for larger r, then I move like this. Even larger r, I move like this. And if I keep increasing r, my trajectory sort of degenerates into this null boundary. So that's why. Scry plus and scry minus can be interpreted intuitively as the orbits of these inertial observers when they are very, very far away in the very far away region, which is nowhere in Minkowski space time, but is a precise place in the Einstein universe. Similarly, if I consider a t equal constant surface, t equals zero is something like that, but if I consider t equal constant for t very, very late, then t later is this. T even later is that if I go for very long, very late times, then my space like surfaces also approach this uh, infinity in this way. And so all this gives some intuitive notion uh, around the, no the, the concept of infinity. And I know it's probably very late. So let me, maybe yes. I should stop there. No, Simone? Yeah, that would be great. Let me stop there. So I will start next time from here. We're gonna use this to define uh, precisely what a black hole is. And I will give you a very neat and simple example of how doing differential geometry with, uh, with this, with this uh, toy compact uh, unphysical metric can be extremely helpful for proving things in the physical world. So with that, we'll stop for today. Um, so, are there questions at this point? We are running a little bit late. So I encourage only uh, short questions with uh, short answers. Uh, 
in the chat, there are a couple of uh, uh, comments, questions that I think can be uh, briefly addressed. So one was earlier on, and it was a question about uh, when you talked about conserved charges in uh, for the geodesics, if you can briefly comment on the distinction between these conserved charges and the ones uh, that concern the dynamics of uh, the whole uh, uh, gravitational field that are studied using uh, covariant phase space methods. Ah, yeah, well, there's a big, huge difference. Here we're talking about conserved quantities associated to the motion of test particles. So these are, these are uh, conserved quantities in the sense that they do not change along the orbits of geodesics, which are representing uh, this test particle. So we're talking about particle, particle dynamics, and these are constants of motion. Now, the charges you're talking about, this concern uh, field theory. And, uh, and so, of course, I mean, this, this, uh, this is something else. Now, if we were probing the geometry with test fields, then you might be interested in knowing how much energy, you know, these fields carry. And then you will be talking about these other uh, concern quantities. And you might go beyond that and actually consider a self-gravitating system, not, not really just uh, you know, test fields. And again, you would be interesting in, interested in knowing you know, if there are some conserved notions that you can use to interpret the physics. And typically, these type of things can often be defined if you have some, some asymptotic structure. I know you have been following some classes in which you talk about this quantities in at finite distances. This is also possible. It's more delicate. And uh, I imagine you have been discussing all the subtleties associated to that. There was another uh, comment, a question that concerned this uh, uh, expansion in the transverse direction of your ellipsoid when you fall into uh, yeah. the singularity. And the common question was whether intuition can be gained from the fact that the Ricci scalar is zero and there's already two contracting directions and therefore there must be a, an expanding direction. Whether ah, that's interesting. Maybe, maybe, maybe. That's an exercise. Tell me next time. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I didn't try. I mean, one, one could try to use that. Any, sir? But any I'm not sure because, yeah, I don't, think you have enough structure. No, I, I don't think it's going to work, but you can try. I mean, r equal to zero is a property of any vacuum solution. I'm not sure. I have to think. I, 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 it might not be useful. OK? Now I think. Certainly, an argument along those lines makes sense with the shear, because the shear is traceless. But with mm. the riches to be seen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, for the, for the shear, that's a good point. Yeah, once you know that two of them are contracting, the other one has to be expanding. That's right, because the trace has to be zero. So anyone with a quick question that possibly has a quick answer? Uh, Here. Ah, I the see that this, somebody that wants to ask a question. Yes, please, let me see how I can unmute you. Uh, no. Okay, I need to find you in the list and then I will allow you here. I cannot unmute you. I can only ask to unmute. Please unmute yourself, turn on your camera and ask a question directly. Yeah. Hello, sir. Um, Dr. Perez, it's a very nice talk. Thank you for this nice talk. Can you also uh, I just want to ask you a question regarding uh, sorry, sir. Can you also turn on your here? camera so that we can see you? Uh, it it doesn't let me. Uh, oh, it isn't okay. letting me uh, no starting problem. the camera. Okay, sorry. Please go ahead with the question. Yeah, uh, so Dr. Perez, my question is uh, obviously regarding this uh, stress and uh, the shear part. So obviously you have not covered it yet uh, in this lecture. So the question is maybe a bit outside of what you discussed today. So I will be very fine to wait until the next day. So uh, 
I understand that this is in um, Schwarzschild uh, black hole. So what happens if we have, say, a Rayster Nostrum or card black hole when we have a Kochi horizon inside? And uh, yeah, how the yeah. how the condition actually differs? Because uh, as I know that the Kochi horizon itself is a very unstable uh, horizon, and it actually on part of if you if you put perturbation on it, it actually goes to uh, it actually becomes a singularity. So, can we use this the yes. argument of shear and stretching and show that as well from yes. this argument? Yes, certainly. I think I do think so. But I, unfortunately, I, I'm I, I mean, preparing. I've been thinking about calculating this in care, but I cannot tell you. But the intuition is that yes, this should be very useful to un for understanding. Uh, you know the 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 the, the, the uh, some some of the of what's going on in the in the in the case of um, Cauchy horizons. But uh, what what I do expect, uh, let me just move to another thing. I do expect is that the analysis, and uh, I mean this is something much easier. That the analysis of these test particles that we saw that. Frequency, proper frequency measures so by so the energy, if you want, or the wavelength measured by this falling observed storm singular, singularity blows up unavoidably when you have angular momentum. I expect a blowing up of that type, type, generic blowing up, meaning once you fix generically the the, <clears throat> the constants of motion that in the case of care will involve L energy, angular momentum, and one more thing that is called the Carter constant of motion, what you would expect is that uh, freak energies on these test particles actually blows up at the Cauchy horizon, not at the singularity, which would be, I mean, I, th I think this is a poor man way of understanding uh, a related result that you just uh, involved, that if you put uh, um, fields and you do perturbation theory, then you get this phenomenon of mass inflation, namely divergences yeah. uh, near the uh, Cauchy horizon. But I believe that you can show all this and get a very uh, good intuition of all that without doing the, uh, with, with only using, by only using these test particles, which is all you need. Because I mean, all this phenomenon of mass inflation is very interesting, but it's very sophisticated mathematics. You have to do perturbation theory in the care, Newman black hole. This is hard and complicated. People have understood it in the 80s and 70s, 80s, 90s. Hmm. This is very interesting, but but if you can get the same idea from test particles, it's much more interesting. And so we're going to talk about. I hope we will mention this next lecture because in the next lecture we'll talk about care and care. All right. Okay. So but, actually, the what I mean, but the shear yeah. uh, analysis is more delicate because first of all you have. I mean, something like that can be done, and I don't know the answer. But it's more. You know, first of all you have to find. The shear of what? What is the shear that you want to calculate, right? Mm -hmm. In Schwarzschild or in Rice and Nostrum, oh, well, Rice and Nostrum can be, in Rice and Nostrum you would know. You will have this article constant surfaces. So in <laughs> Rice and Nostrum, yeah, this calculation could be generalized and it would be interesting to see what happens near the Cauchy horizon. Actually, there, why it's more complicated, right? Because oh, yeah. there is no analog of article constant surfaces. Yes, yes. So I think it's very interesting, but I don't know the answer. I didn't do so it. Actually, uh, my goal of asking this question, actually, there are some uh, analytical calculation. Uh, Dr. Cardoso have done it a few years ago, where he used quasinormal modes of uh, quasinormal modes and uh, this photon sphere modes to show that analytically we can uh, check whether the Cauchy horizon stability and the strong cosmic censorship conjecture actually is valid or not. Mm -hmm. So my idea was that can this shear calculations can also be another analytical calculation by which we can show that the stability of Cauchy horizon with a particular field, say Dirac field or M or just M, uh, any normal field in some space time, say where the Cauchy horizon is there, based on Nostrum card. Yeah, I, so I think, I think there might be a way of thinking this way. I mean, with test, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, this is referring to the dynamics of test particles. Yes, but yes. the dynamics of test particles is also related to the WKB approximation of field theories, right? Yes. And yes. So, yes. So it, it's it, it looks interesting to explore these things, and I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, it's a nice, interesting idea. 
Thank you, sir. Well, very good. I think it's time to let the students uh, rest for a good 15 minutes before the